thank you. And thank you for saying. I know that this is the last talk for today. I hope that you have been enjoying the conference so far. I know I have. Um, my name is David. I work for Protocol Labs. And at Protocol Labs, we do research, development, and deployment of new technologies, well, protocols, uh, to make the web better. Today, I want to talk to you about stellar module management. And when I say module, I could really mean like package, I could mean repo, I could mean tarball, or even container. Essentially, those units of logic that you typically create so you, you can reuse yourself or share it with the others. The way that I structured my presentation, I'll just start with the motivations and challenges of making module management and how to move code around in an organization. And I will reference NPM, the package manager that we know and love in the Node.js community, talk about the web, um, the current state of the web, and IPFS, a new hypermedia transfer. I will finish this presentation with something new, a new star in this constellation, something like a bridge between IPFS and the package management tools that we have available at our disposal. So when we talk about module management, it's very important to, like, what actually is a module? And this is typically very biased uh, by the language that we are using. Unless we decide to expose this module, this piece of software, through a network interface or connecting everything through pipes in a very unique way. After we create this piece of logic, we want to be able to share it and enable other people to discover. That's when typically a web page for the project or a registry came along. And we still have to decide how to transport these modules and make it uh, reach the machines that they are going to be used on. We have to deal with updates and especially security patches. And while we are at it, we have to make sure that each time we push an update, uh, we don't break other users' apps by breaking the user space. Uh, structure is also a very like, important question when we are dealing with module management, because depending on the structure and how we organize our modules, we can tune it for performance, bandwidth savings, space savings, um, and speed. And how to check what I'm actually running is what I wanted in the first place. And even like last but not the least, there is ownership. Who owns the module? Who is allowed to change it? Who can, where can it be run? And where can we be accessible? And this is like, like a few, uh, but the very, like some of the most important questions that we have to make when we want to make a package manager or a module management tool. Uh, if these things seem very, I don't know, like some of these problems seem to have obvious solutions, that's because in the Node.js community, we are very spoiled, right? We have NPM. And NPM was like the panacea for module management. Um, when, uh, when NPM appeared, it made some really smart design realizations that were not possible 20 or 30 years ago. For example, today, storage is cheap, and bandwidth is virtually free. Um, and in the early days, things like Unix pipes came along, and one of the reasons why they came along was because they could not put a big program in memory, so they created like small independent programs that they could connect together. Today, NPM was uh, able uh, to make the decision of just like downloading modules several times, um, even if they have to repeat the same download, uh, and create this dependency tree that like solved so many problems uh, of module management. It's true that today there is a flat dependency tree, but like in the beginning, a decision of like downloading the module uh, over and over again solved a lot of the problems. And also, it's like it's easy to share. We can just like with an npm publish, we can push a module to the registry. It's easy to discover and also fun. Uh, we have this nice web page where we can look for other people's code. And again, as I said, there is the, it's dependency how free. We never have conflicts between modules versions. Uh, NPM should really be a case study for all the other package managers. It's almost even sad that other languages are still fighting with their module management tools when there is like NPM already out there that has proved this concept. However, um, and although NPM is really awesome, uh, NPM still lives on the web, this neural network that we grow to rely and depend on. And this system, the web, that we can deploy new apps and services, granting users with new capabilities, almost like superpowers, is very fragile. If we lose connection to the backbone, the service is gone. We cannot use it anymore. And there is several reasons why this is it this way, but most bubble up from one design decision that was made in the beginning of the web, which was location addressing. Location addressing makes the web very simple. We have an address, uh, or we have a name that we can resolve to an address, and this location becomes our central point of authority. 
uh, for the documents that we are looking for. What this translates in the network is that like, if I'm looking for some file, I just have to find the machine that's the responsible for that file. And although it is simple, um, it doesn't necessarily fulfill all of the use cases that we can um, have at our disposal today. For example, um, in this room, right? If I or someone here wants to share a package, a module, with everyone else, uh, it has to publish to NPM. And then everyone else has to go to NPM and fetch this module. Uh, the problem is, like, if, what happens if we lose the connection to NPM, to the backbone? It's simply like if the hotel internet uh, get, gets disconnected. Um, we cannot access this, that module anymore. And it's, it's strange, right? Because like, the module is right here in the same room, and like, we cannot access it. And we have all of these machines at our disposal with all of these resources and capabilities, but we are not using it to the full extent. And there's like several other problems in the web. It's uh, the disconnected scenarios, problems with bandwidth, uh, permanence, security, be, uh, the fact that the web is mostly being kicked out of IoT, and also there's like problems with control and censorship. Um, but yeah, like location address is like one of the fundamental problems that created all of the other ones. And that's where IPFS comes along. IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System. And the name is an homage to GCR Liquider, which designs ideas and work really inspired the, or, the original internet, which the name stands for the Intergalactic Network. You can really feel like the ambition of the original project when um, someone sets up the goal of building the Intergalactic Network. And we decided to build the Interplanetary um, because it layers really well as well on the idea of like, being the file system for the web over IP. Uh, and IPFS is a protocol to upgrade the web, to make it off work offline, to make it smarter, to make it distributed, to make it permanent, to make it safer, and especially faster. Uh, if we don't make the web faster, it will never see the adoption that we need to actually create the impact. And IPFS, in the end, is just really a collection of really great ideas that are available uh, in systems that we know today, like BitTorrent and Git, and others from the academia, like SFS and DHTs and really boiling all of these ideas together and creating a system and deploying it to the network. This is the IPFS stack. And another way to look at it is we have, of course, the users using IPFS and are creating applications. And we have the naming system based on David Mazir's York with a self-certified file system. And we have the Merkle DAG. And the Merkle DAG is the core piece of IPFS. The Merkle DAG enables us to make a distinction between links that are immutable and mutable on the web enabling us to create better caching policies and moving the content around the network uh, preemptively. And then we have a uh, leap peer-to-peer, -peer, which is our network stack, and now we connect and discover other peers. And what is a Merkle deck? And like, the first question is, like, where is this Merkle name come from? Um, Merkle, um, Merkle deck means that we have a graph, a directly, a directly a cyclic graph. And we have links in that graph, and those links are uh, immutable. If, for example, if I want to connect those, these two pieces of data, um, I simply have to hash the first piece and add this hash to the second piece. And now I have an immutable link. I have a, always a way to tell which data I'm pointing uh, at any moment in time. And we call this a Merkle link because the original idea came from Ralph C. Merkle uh, with the Merkle tree. But this realization, we are not the first ones doing this realization. Like, we have all the systems that we use every day um, that use also Merkle linking or Merkleized data structures. For example, Git is one of them. Mer Git is a Merkle tree. The blockchain is a Merkleized data structure. It uses the same strategy. And there is, are others, right? Um, and there's like this collection of Merkle trees and these several implementations um, available uh, at our disposal. And by the way, whoever said that like, Money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, I didn't, they didn't expect for Bitcoin to appear. Um, so IPFS. IPFS is like the Merkle forest. Uh, it's a place where all of the Merkle trees can live happily uh, in one cohesive manner. And just to explain and to illustrate the, powerful, uh, the power of Merkle linking, let me like, just bring the... Um, SVS, uh, CVS, SVN versus Git case. So remember the good old days when we were shipping code to CVS and SVN. Um, if, if the network went down, uh, we could not work anymore, right? Like we cannot commit code anymore. 
And then like if the server went down or was destroyed, all of our work would be simply gone as well. And then like Git appeared and changed completely uh, the paradigm. It basically said, let's put all of the entities that are participating on these transactions, speaking the same protocol and having the full implementation. And what that meant was that like we can cut the connection and like Git will still work. Uh, we can like destroy the servers and the users can still use other ways to transfer data. Uh, if it's my email or USB or like local line networks, doesn't matter. It will still work, and we can still um, improve our pro continue working our projects. And IPFS is basically doing that for the entire web. So again, on IPFS, uh, or again on the Merkle deck, uh, in IPFS, data forms a deck, and again. Um, it's called the Merkle DAG because links are uh, cryptographic ashes. And any data structure can be represented as a DAG from Unix uh, files and directories, Git, Bitcoin, key value stores, and there is even people working on an SQL uh, database on top of IPFS. It's pretty incredible. Well, how does it compare to the web that we have today? So we are used to this idea of like having a domain resolving to a location. With IPFS, you have a name that resolves to a content hash so that we can link to the, the content that we are looking for in the first place. So again, HTTP case, we have this notion that like, we are looking for the resource in some server, and IPFS uh, means that like, I'm looking for the content by the hash, so I can like, fetch from other peers that already have downloaded this content, or even like, make sure that if I have downloaded the content already, I can verify that I have the content in my local machine by checking the hash. Uh, and this is the way uh, that we have at our disposal to create immutable data and to move it around in the network very efficiently. But uh, what about mutability? It's true that like, we could use DNS for mutability and just like, update the pointers on these domain records, but we want IPFS to be really, really fast. So um, we added one layer in the middle called IPNS. So not only building the file system for the web, but also the naming system for the web. Um, and IPNS basically is a layer in the middle that is a mutable pointer. And the way that I create this mutable pointer, I just grab a, key, a public and private key pair. Uh, I get the hash of the public key. I create a record. Um, I create a record with the hash that I want to point to, and I sign this record with my private key and deploy it to the network. So that when other peers are looking for this hash of the public key, they can not only download the record from the network, but also validate the signature and have the same kind of trust that you would put on a central point of authority. Um, so, yeah. So, we know how to do immutable files, we know how to construct um, like directories and files inside IPFS through the Merkle deck, we have, we have mutable pointers. How can we find all of these uh, files, all of this data on the network itself? And the secret is uh, DHTs, distributed hash tables. DHTs are like the holy grail of peer-to-peer -peer networks. And the way that like, DHTs work, and I just like, want to give like, a thin overview, uh, is like you give each node, like each peer on the network, one ID, and you have like, this one dimension of IDs. And each time you want to serve a file to the network, you just simply hash the file, get its ID, and put some pointers, like sprinkle some pointers on those nodes that have an ID closer to the ID of my file. So then when someone goes after that file, it will contact the nodes that are, again, close to that ID and see the pointers and see where the, node, the file is located. Okay, so this was a very quick overview. Um, we definitely can go more in depth after the talk. But what you get with IPFS, you get discovery through IPNS, you get integrity through cryptographic hashing, you get activity because in peer-to-peer -peer networks you have the inverse scaling problem. The more people uh, downloading the file, the more people you have serving, so uh, the more downloads, the merrier. You have structure because you just have to download things once, like since you can validate uh, the content that you have available through their hashes. You have the transport where you can like, stream from say, several peers at the same time. You can update just by syncing the changes, and you have the idea of ownership uh, because like IPNS records, as I said, are signed by private keys. And this, are, this, like, this list of features is very similar, or basically matches all of the needs for uh, package management. So I just explain about IPFS. What if we use this and apply to NPM? What we could, could we get uh, from a system like this if we use it as a transport for moving our NPM modules around? And for that, I have a demo to show you. So just like let me
view my display. All right. Everyone can see this? Yeah. yeah. So the first thing I have to do is like start the IPFS daemon. So actually, I have to init it first. I w wanted to start from scratch. I have to start my IPFS daemon um, so that I'm part of the network. OK, all good. And then we have created this module called Registry M Mirror. And I'm going to tell to Registry Mirror that I want a proxy, uh, um, a, like I want to simulate NPM API locally, and when someone requests a module, to use IPFS to download that module for me. I'm just going to select a port, like 95 95, just for convenience. OK, I have to say. I want to run this as a daemon. That's true. OK. So um, now that registry mirror is going, uh, is running, what it is doing is like fetching from the IPFS network the latest state of the registry. Um, oh, well, it seems I'm having some network problems. OK, but I was prepared. Um, I, I recorded a video, just make sure that I. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I can like show the demo uh, after. I, just, I don't know what I tested it during the lunch break. So, as I was showing, uh, we need the daemon, we run IPFS daemon, um, we, we start the daemon, we connect to the network, we start this registry mirror thing. Um, we said that we want to use IPFS, uh, start on the port, um, it connects to the network, fetches the list. Uh, like the latest state of NPM, so like the list of hashes that correspond to the, all of the module versions, uh, all of the modules and all the, its versions. And then I, I said that I want to install uh, a module using this local registry, this local proxy. And it installed. So like we are installing modules from, from NPM, uh, from NPM by having this, this bridge through IPFS. But the really cool part, like, we always like, have installed modules from NPM, right? So the really cool part is like, when I get into a disconnected environment. What if I want to work in a plane, a train, uh, in a scenario that the network is very low bandwidth, and that I don't have like, a very good connection to the backbone? So that, that's the beauty of APFS. And just like, showing you here, I, I, like, so this is a VM. I just changed to the VM that's using another like, uh, internet interface, um, another wireless card. And I was connecting to the same router here. So that like, it's like two separate machines. Do the same process. And then I, I was just like start this ping. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, no, wait. Oh, my god. Um, OK. So I just wanted to point out. So like, I just started the ping to show that I, I was connected. And now what I'm going to do is like something that you never want to do, right? Shutting off the internet. Oh my god, where is the data? Um, <laughs> uh, and now what do you think will happen? Uh, any ideas? Any bets? I'm going to try to install the same module that the other machine that's on the same local area network is. And well, I'll save RAM roll. And it's going to install. So what happened here is we managed to find. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so IP, like, both IPFS demons found each other in the local area network and just announced to each other, oh, I have the module that you're looking for. Just fetch it from me. This has a like, huge amount of like, saving bandwidth um, on the network. So, so yeah, this was my demo. OK, continuing. Um, continuing my talk. So right now, we can have this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed. Um, the registry continues to be the registry, and we continue to have this point that we can trust to fetch our modules and to discover the modules. But we can now not only download it from the, the NPM data servers, but we can also like, fetch it from our friends' computers, our neighbors' computers, like everyone, anyone else that has the module available on their machine. And Substack in 2013, 2013, two, two years ago, was proposing this idea at LXS. And now it's finally possible. Like we finally can do it. We can f uh, finally have a distributed NPM and make sure that like not only um, we can use it to make our operations faster, 
uh, but we can like bring this technology to countries that have lower bandwidth and more disconnected scenarios and enabling them to use the modules that we are uh, providing to NPM. I think that it's pretty awesome, right? You know, like mandatory cast gift. Um, cool. So um, I actually didn't know my time. Actually, I'm over time. So yeah, uh, thank you for your attention and for being here. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation.